the future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Let's see how it works actually. So can you see my screen? Yeah, so this is about just using Intel PT for general vulnerability analysis or uh, exploit analysis, or maybe possibly security researchers in, researches in general. So I work for Darren Green, it's a new company, just one person company right now. So maybe I can introduce because uh, many people doesn't know me, I think. Uh, actually, I'm the author of Darren Green Patch Dipping Tools, maybe 10 years ago. So after I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a security researcher, actually, um, uh, there were some legal bindings that I can't work on the open source project at the time. Now it's, uh, it's very loose, but at the time it was a very strict because it was not, it was the previous uh, CEO, CEO and he, he hated <laughs> open source, right? But now I, I'm out of Microsoft and I'm just trying to revive the framework as a more of data science kit that you can work. Right? You can use uh, Jupyter Notebooks to load binary data and maybe you can perform some statistical analysis. It's still work in progress. And as I said, I worked for Microsoft uh, for 10 years and I mostly I worked as a defender, but now I, I look, in, look into both sides. The NSO groups you talked about, all these groups, the zero days, whenever the zero day comes out, then MSRC and our team actually work together to uh, find how the exploit mechanisms, how they are bypassing, yeah, those things, to research those things. So currently I'm just startup starter. So uh, it's really early phase, I'm just looking around different technologies and how I can use them for possibly security product or maybe threat analysis, right? So Intel PT is one of those uh, technologies. So what is Intel PT? So it's a process, uh, processor trace actually, right? So the feature is supported by the processor the, from the hardware. And uh, the documentation actually says it is supported from Broadwell, actually Intel Broadwell CPUs, but uh, practically it, it only works uh, after Skylake CPUs. And all those tools and anything that are available, they only work on Skylake. But most uh, Skylake, I don't know, it was 2017, I guess. I don't know exact timeline when Skylake was available. It was five or four or five years ago. So most of your computers might have these features enabled, embedded already. So what you can do with Intel PT? So uh, basically you can trace uh, code execution in instruction level. Uh, technically they only trace control flow changes, but using combining with uh, some the instruction images, actually you can reconstruct the whole full uh, instructions. So you can use triggering or filtering, filtering by CPLs. Maybe you can just trace kernel uh, code executions, or maybe you can just trace uh, process images. CR3, maybe if it accesses some memory pages, maybe then you can access it, right? Or you can filter by IP ranges. Maybe you want just filter, uh, monitor some code executions inside some modules, for example, right? Those things are possible. So it's very strong. And if you know how to use this uh, technology, it will help you very well with uh, multiple different uh, jobs in security field, actually. So it's not just uh, for, for example, the AFL fudging, right? So they, they, they are trying to use, they, they made the AFL uh, fudger uh, using uh, Intel PT as a kind of feedback loop for the code coverage, right? But it's very slow. So you will know why it's very slow. I don't know if there, there is any improvement these days, but last time I checked, it was very slow. So the intended usage is actually post-mortem analysis of crashes or some performance issues. Uh, you wanna actually uh, collect uh, these uh, traces and you can check where is the, all the CPUs are used for code executions and you can just fix it, right? And 
when when uh, some program crashes, actually you can enrich the cost cost stack information using uh, this integrity. So this presentation is not actually. I don't want to go really deep into the Intel PT. I will just go overview of this technology. But with this presentation, we want to explore the practical, right? So practical, okay, not about writing papers or those things, academia researches, but more of how we can really use it for daily uh, basis jobs, right? So that is the focus of this talk. So using Intel PT on Windows, uh, I spent a lot of time just figuring this out, actually. So because uh, originally the Windows Intel PT2, uh, it was released by the Cisco Talos guys actually, right? So one of those guy is, guys is actually working for Microsoft now. Uh, he made this tool actually, it does every single uh, small, small uh, uh, configuration for Intel PT actually, right? So it's uh, from scratch, it's a driver, but it only works for Windows 10 pre RS6 because uh, after Windows 10 RS6, uh, Microsoft uh, introduced IPT.sys. IPT uh, as the name suggests, actually it's the driver for IPT collection, right? So this driver actually checks whether there is another uh, session actually going on. And if it detects Windows Intel PT or any kind of driver that actually accesses some specific MSR, uh, MSR area, then it will actually blue screen the system. So you can't use Windows in the PT for uh, Windows 10 post RS6. But conveniently, Alexi Ionescu actually made this Win IPT tool that is wraps around this interface for IPT.sys, and you can just conveniently use that. So it's really easy. So the other option is actually using Intel debug extension. It's a Win debug extension, right? So you have uh, you need actually two machines, one physical, uh, two physical machines. One machine you actually uh, uh, launch Win debugger with this this exten extension uh, installed, and the other machine is the target debug uh, target machine with uh, kernel debugging enabled and USB kernel debugging enabled, and you need special. Uh, USB cable for those work. It's, I don't know, $16 or $20 somewhere, New Egg or maybe Amazon, they sell it. And you connect it actually using the remote kernel debugging session. Actually, you can initiate uh, uh, these inter, inter PT sessions. So for Linux, there are a lot of information. Actually, you can just go, uh, go to this link and you can find a lot of good information. Uh, actually, actually, the real challenge comes when you try to decode uh, this Intel PT uh, log, actually, right? So uh, for, for analysis of this recorded package, actually, you can use libipt uh, library. Uh, it's a multi-platform library from Intel. Uh, it is basically a very uh, standard library that can expand uh, this Intel PT traces into human readable, maybe instructions or dump code. So mainly you will use two tools, PT dump and PT EXD. PT dump is just dumping the raw data uh, from the binary uh, trace log. PT, X, uh, PT oh, it not, it's not like EXD, PT XED actually. XED is uh, the disassembler from Intel. So PT XED is actually um, uh, disassemble actual instructions from uh, uh, Intel PT trace log. So the, for this decoding purposes, actually, because the Intel PT only logs control flow changes, so it only logs the actual uh, addresses, bunch of addresses uh, using different uh, packets. So it doesn't save actual instruction bytes. So you need to have that instruction sources somewhere. Uh, from this diagram, for example, PTXED uses uh, PT dump the trace log as a source for the control flow change. Uh, and PE or ELF uh, files as a kind of raw instruction byte uh, sources, right? And you can take uh, the actual raw instruction bytes from process dump. 
the only problem is that PTXED doesn't understand P or process DOM. They, it understand ERF, I guess. But, uh, usually I do some researches on Windows platform. PTXED doesn't understand P. Uh, the only way is uh, based upon this PT dump, uh, it shows them some address, address information, right? So extracting that address information from these executables or process terms, you need to manually extract those instruction bytes it, because it's a raw instruction byte without any headers, nothing, it's just raw instruction byte. PTXD takes some inputs as uh, those files, raw instruction bytes of files, and they can reconstruct free instruction based upon that. So for practical purposes, uh, just you, you will just spend whole day just uh, figuring out which memory area you wanna take out for this PTXD tool. So I don't think you can use it for any practical purposes. Maybe you can just investigate whether the process dump, uh, the PT dump is uh, correct or it has some information you might want, right? So there is another challenge is like, because Intel PT relies on this static uh, instruction bytes. For example, if you think about G code execution, so just think about Edge or Chrome browser, they use a lot of G uh, memory area. Right? They just run JavaScript code as a assembly code, just compile and run, and the area is garbage collected. It, it will be gone. Then and there is no point, you know, whether the memory area is actually the instructions that actually the interpret logged or not. So that is one challenge. Uh, the other challenge is shellcode. Shellcode is very similar to JIT actually, but it's just static code, right? It's not compiled, but it just lives on the memory and goes away. So these two of them are challenges and possibly limitations with uh, Intel PT technology, but yeah, somebody will figure it out how we can do that. But for now, we just want to focus on the, some static memory images and how we can figure out how we can uh, just analyze uh, some control flow changes we are interested in. Uh, to understand or use Intel PT actually, so because, uh, uh, Intel PT is a very, uh, uses a lot of compressed recording. Actually, you want to understand how they are compressing this record and it will help you very well with uh, further analysis because it will give you a lot of hints about the, those control flow changes. So one barrier in util utilizing Intel PT is just compressed format. And you need to decompress, you need to use lib IPT, I said. For example, there is a branches, right? So similar to LBR. So I don't know if, if you are old school, you remember LBR. So somebody actually from the reverse engineer community, someone actually tried to use LBR to uh, reconstruct a full uh, code coverage, I remember. Uh, but Intel PT is more powerful actually. So when CPU encounters any branch instructions, jump, uh, JE, call, red, any instructions, that makes uh, these branches, right? Then it do record actions um, and it uses T or NT uh, one bit information uh, for these jumps and no jumps actually, right? It just uh, record, it, record in very, very compressed format. I will talk about those packets later. So indirect calls and jumps, there's no way you can just use a very small uh, compressor format. You, you just record the full thing. Sometimes it just uh, compress it. Maybe if it is 64-bit address space, maybe you can just record 32-bit based upon whether it's your near jump or far jump, right? So unconditional branches, just like a jumps or maybe calls to some, some static uh, uh, predetermined uh, memory addresses, then actually you don't need to record it because from the instruction byte, you can figure it out, right? Those things are just gone. Intel PT logs will not have that information. And this will make a lot of confusions actually when you try to understand the Intel PT logs. So IP compression itself, whenever it uh, logs some uh, instruction pointer logs, actually upper parts are missed. Uh, whenever some overlap happens with uh, some previous uh, uh, records, actually. So to save those uh, space. 
So to record all these things, they use a package, right? Package are just uh, packets. And there are a lot of different packets, but PSB is some kind of boundaries because if you log a lot of information, maybe some, some, some data in the middle may be corrupted. I don't know, maybe sometimes hardware error, error or something, but you don't want to throw away whole thing. Right? PSB, just make it packet boundaries. So any information inside that boundary, they're just valid as itself. You can, you can just take them, then they will make, it, make sense itself. Right? So that is PSB. Uh, actually, through this presentation, actually, it, we will call it sync offset, right? PSB locations, we will refer it as sync offset because uh, libipt code actually use sync offset uh, pointing to PSB locations. So it's very convenient just using sync offset as this uh, term for uh, PSB locations. TAB is target IP. Whenever you call something uh, for indirect jumps, indirect calls, you need to log whole thing, right? So in that case, it's T, T IP, target IP. T and T is whatever you take jumps or not taking jumps. So compression overview. So based upon this PSV, T, TNT, T, TNT, it, it just repeats. And based upon this data, actually you can reconstruct full instructions. So if you look at the, some trace logs, actually, uh, here is a snippet of IPT logs. Actually, I can share a full thing later. But uh, if you look at this, this is uh, output from, actually the original PT dump is uh, binary, right? So using PT dump, you can make it as text format so that we can understand what is happening. Of that 1C, it has a PSV. It has a lot of pad bytes, but it means that from here, actually we can make sense of these uh, IPT logs. Add offset 3 dB, for example, for this log. It says TPG. So there is a PG packet. It means the instruction pointer is located at the location in the indicated by the packet, which is 0007. Yeah, it's a very familiar address space, right? So 3470. So we are starting from there. So this packet is logging something starting from here. So this location, right, from this uh, packet, PG is here. So I extracted this from IDA. You can extract it from process dump too. So you can see that all these instructions are just doing some stack operations, um, maybe GS60, maybe shellcode, I don't know. Then it just goes and calls some static address. And it has TPGE indicated that. Uh, from this location. Uh, the next call is very interesting, right? Because this call is just a static uh, location inside the binary. So from the packet, it doesn't log anything about this call. So the execution actually will continue to the target address of this call. And if you use PTXCD, it will actually decode everything here. So it doesn't know the, it doesn't care about the bound, boundaries of these calls or anything. It just follows uh, these instructions. So for indirect calls, somehow you can just uh, just decode the full thing. There is no instruction that are interesting, but here uh, 63332 location, it calls some RAX location. Uh, if you are just human, you can just figure out, oh, RAX, RAX is com coming from here. So you can just know that, oh, this is a location, right? But uh, whatever these tools, they need some information, control flow change, flow change information, and it just logs uh, the lower, lower bytes. So it's uh, for FB70, FB70, uh, it's calling there. CS location. Uh, I don't know, the, there is some address discrepancies here, but uh, address is uh, 3332. 
Yeah, I, and maybe this is for other one. So 33 TIP just designate to some indirect calls. And you know that uh, the target is uh, at uh, 4 FB70. And decoding continues, 70 just goes. And now you have J and G, so it's a branches. And you need to figure out it take it took the branch or not. Uh, that is coded as TNT. So dot dot, I figured out this is not taking the, it didn't take two uh, conditional jumps, actually. This is type I have some typos here. But next, it will encounter red instructions at uh, FB94. Then we might know from this, uh, just statically uh, analyzing this assembly, we know that we, where it will return. But this thing doesn't know where it will return. So the uh, process process trace will record the location of the return address, right? Return address uh, is uh, basically indirect jump. So decoding continues and so on, right? So this thing is, uh, this is how it works actually. So uh, actually I can show you, yeah, I can share it later actually. So the only cha challenge we have, some challenges we have is, is that uh, if you run, if you decode full instruction bytes for, for example, if you run office program, for example, uh, 10 seconds, it will generate 1.4 or 1.5, for example, right? For 1.4, 1 1.5 uh, size of uh, process trace, for example, because it just dumps the ring buffer, full ring buffer memory that is uh, uh, designated from the command. Then out of those, the actual, uh, the recording is only, I don't know, a few hundred megabytes. But if you try to expand full instructions out of it, it will become, I don't know, actually I didn't, I couldn't expand everything for just 10 seconds of office trace because the output is too big for every single instructions. Possibly it will be a few hundred gigabytes. And if you use libidt tool, actually I couldn't finish it because when I run it on my machine, I have a server machine at home. Uh, I waited, I don't know, 16 hours to decode a 10 second amount of uh, IPT log because I wanted some full logs for the process space because you don't know whenever some uh, exploit works, you never know where the actual exploit will jump to. And I wanted that full logs, right? So just a few hundred megabytes of actual Intel PT data expanded to a few hundred gigabytes possibly uh, data and just decoding takes possibly uh, more than a day. So it's not really practical. So I figured out uh, the de decoding process is very slow because our Libra IPT just uses a single CPU because it's just simple operation. So you are supposed to build your tools upon this Libra IPT because it's just library. So IPT analyzer is uh, just Python wrapper around uh, libipt. I just expose very, very uh, essential uh, methods out from libipts. I just built uh, my own class out of these libipt uh, functions, and I just exposed uh, some of those methods. Maybe you can expand it later for your purposes. But basically what it does is just doing the operations we did, the decoding operations in parallel. Uh, this is possible because all these packet boundaries are kind of, they are kind of independent. So if you run multiple processes using this libipt or IPT analyzer code upon this uh, separate um, uh, PSB boundaries, right? PS packet boundaries, then you can actually uh, process, process them separately, then reconstruct them later as a one single uh, code execution path. Uh, so that is the idea. And it took a few days just uh, to build the tool. Basically, uh, I can show the code. Basically what it does is just, uh, 
exposing very simple interface. Right? Just open the libipt, you get the sync offset, and you can add image ba image base because when you want to decode some instruction bytes, uh, the uh, IP locations you actually need that actual instruction byte images. So you can add it, and you can you can actually decode some instructions at some point. You can actually decode it by block uh, segment or something, and actually you can get some information from the uh, IPT file too. The actual interface, Python interface, is in PyIPT. So this is a wrapper, right? So it has one instruction class. The first is just IPT, some general class. The next one is instructions, blocks, uh, and error codes, right? So it's just three simple uh, classes, right? You want to work on some blocks, Block means page blocks, right? Blocks or instructions from IPT log. So you can open some IPT log using IPT class. You can locate some code blocks you are interested in. And actually you can dump actual instructions from those blocks. So that is the idea that I have. So based upon this uh, interface wrapped around the Python, you can actually build different tools. And these are some example tools that I built. For example, you wanna enumerate every uh, function calls from these IPT logs. Using lib IPT, it's almost impossible. You, I don't know, full day maybe. But using this tool, it uses a WinDebugger tool which uses PyKD to actually load a WinDebugger process dump. So the idea is that whenever you take interpreted dump, at the end of the session or in the middle, maybe you can take multiple dumps. You take process dump and you just save it somewhere. Later, you just combine this internal PT trace uh, with um, this process dump. And IPT analyzer will understand uh, this wind debugger uh, process dump process dump, right? So then it will just automatically extract uh, the memory locations that are loaded inside the interpreter. So very simple idea, and it saves a lot of time for you. So block analyzer, you just, uh, the thing is that it's just reading caches, right? So it doesn't, these tools doesn't read uh, interpreter log directly because it's uh, kind of just flat files, and then you never know where is the, uh, locations that you are interested in. So before that, actually, you need to uh, generate a cache file. So this is a tool, cache.py. So it will just enumerate any, uh, it will just uh, decode the full interpreter log and it will enumerate because a lot of security researches are based upon the block start locations, function start, some uh, jump, uh, the location where jump is uh, pointing to. So we just cache those locations. Uh, I can show you later, but usually those cache is from out of 1.4 gigabytes uh, interpreted log, 300 megabytes meaningful uh, the packet data the block cache is uh, around 500 megabytes actually. Using this block cache, you can locate the locations, the locations that you are interested in very easily. So this one, find API call. So for example, you wanna find, for example, kernel authority to create file. So you pass it as an argument here, then it will load the process dump. Then it will enumerate some modules, and it will resolve the symbol and it will extract the exact memory address for kernel authority to create file. Then it will just enumerate the blocks, right? Then we wanna CR3 is zero, but default is zero, but it don't, we are not actually just processing this right now, but address based upon this address location, then you can actually find the actual PSB location that actually contains uh, contains that um, uh, create file calls, 
right? So everything is processed by this PSV blocks. Then from this uh, PSV block, we do further uh, analysis and we can actually enumerate each instructions that are calling this current file. So that is the idea. And here is one case study. Actually, I uh, shared this through the blog post. This is one of the uh, easiest and can be complicated uh, example because this is, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, office equation editor vulnerability from 2017. But there were a lot of variant found later and Microsoft actually removed the binary. The thing is that this is stack overflow from very old legacy component from Office. But the thing is that the, the exploit technique is using actually returning some location. It's, it's just, it's not ROP, but it's using some ROP-like technique. So from bug, try, triage, or vulnerability analysis point of view, it's not really easy to figure out what is happening there, right? Because you want some accurate information when that uh, control flow changes. So that's why I chose the uh, chose uh, this example. So I used WinIPT to to just take the dump. Uh, this is the example you can just acquire from some public sources actually. IPT tool is a WinIPT tool that is included in the Alex Ionos Ionesco's uh, GitHub repository. You can just pass process ID and log filing. So, for example, uh, I launch uh, Office uh, Exploit, and it will actually launch Equation Editor as a uh, decom object, right? Decom process, and I acquire the process ID and just pass it as a argument here, and I'll put this EQ Equation Editor .pt just naming. .pt is just a uh, process trace file. So it runs, uh, the thing is that uh, even though this tool is really cool, um, sometimes th there might be some timing issues. There can be a lot of different issues. So maybe you might want to try multiple times, so, right? So sometimes it creates really awesome uh, processor trace file that has full information. Sometimes somehow, it misses something, right? It's not corrupt, but it misses some information that we need. We need it. So sometimes you get some partial dump. I don't know, I didn't root cause all these things, why it's happening. But you might want to try multiple times. If you look at the dump file and if you run PT dump or PT XED, you know that it's correct or not. So now you have the dump. Uh, you need to take process dump using proc dump, process explorer, then just take process dump from this process, education editor.dx. Then you run IPT analyzer. Uh, actually, the tool name is uh, decode blocks. You just pass uh, the process uh, trace dump file. And this is a memory dump file. It will generate the cache file. So cache file will expedite whole uh, analysis later. So if you run this um, uh, command, I have some old geo machine at home. It has, I don't know, 32 core or something. So it's not super fast, it's not super slow, but it has a lot of cores, right? I ran it maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, but the latest machines, if you have, I don't know, eight, 16 cores, my yeah, maximum maybe 10 minutes maybe if you have really slow machines maybe i don't know maybe 30 minutes but the block cache is just 500 megabytes anyway so based upon that like uh, it's just running different python process using processing multi-processing uh, component so it's they are just they are not just uh, fully utilizing the cpus just three percent because the windows is just limiting the cpus whatever uh, then uh, for this vulnerability analysis, because this is just one case study, how you can uh, apply this interpreting technology, right? 
So equation editor, the if you if you know though if you did any vulnerability analysis or exploit analysis, you know that whenever the control flows uh, changes, it's it's a bad sign, right? From we know that the vulnerability might be inside this equation editor. So we have some assumptions and we want to know the memory, memory uh, address range for this module. So from the process dump, we know that it, even, it doesn't even use the ASNR because it's a legacy component. So start and this range, we know that uh, some code executed inside this address range is something and it made some malicious code control flow changes. So we want to dump uh, any block, um, any blocks, basic blocks between this memory address range ranges, right? So using dump blocks tool, you just provide process uh, PT file. You provide, uh, provide a memory uh, dump as you did before and you provide a cache file generated beforehand, right? Then you give this memory range 40000 to the end address, so SNE. Then dump blocks will generate uh, full log of basic blocks. So it will not generate full instructions. So it just, just shows the block, basic block changes. So it just utilizes the sync offset things, right? Block cache file contains um, block address and matching sync offset. So it just goes through this block cache file and you know where is the PSP package that is matching that. So now you know that whenever something happens, this is just uh, some casual investigation, but you can make some uh, automation based upon these patterns of exploits later, actually. So that is something that I want to do uh, as a next step for this tool. So this is more of manual uh, fashion. So your assumption is that the control flow change comes almost last phase to last uh, instances of these uh, basic blocks of this module. So this is the uh, almost last part of these basic block changes. We know that maybe the return instruction here looks suspicious, right? If you don't find anything interesting from here, maybe you can try next, next, next blocks here. But this one might be interesting then you need to note uh, the sync offset here. 2D236C is the actual offset from the process dump. So using this sync offset, actually you can dump the detailed instruction around uh, this uh, basic block. Then you might uh, encounter some interesting instructions there, right? So using dump instructions tool, you just pass process trace memory dump and the uppercase S argument, you pass sync offset, right? You, you got this sync offset from previous investigation, this sync offset, right? So you are dumping some instructions from almost the end of uh, uh, control flow changes from equation editor module itself, because if something exploited, it will come from equation editor, it will do some, vulnerable code uh, execution, then it will just jump to some shell code or something. That is the assumption. So we just, uh, e, is, e is end of, end, uh, uh, what is that? PSV, uh, packet log sync offset. So we don't want to dump full things, right? So we just want to dump uh, some range of this, uh, um, uh, what is that, this uh, PSV block. Now, if you just dump that last locations, it's a very small file, then you, you can, it, it will dump the instructions, actual single instructions, single, every single instructions. You can um, identify here, right? Instruction framework, uh, equation editor frame, WinProg, some offsets, but maybe some buffer flow happened just before here. So maybe you can do further, uh, investigation there. But the interesting point is here, 
right? So the end of this uh, function call, it returns, but it returns again, then it goes nowhere because uh, this is a very legacy module. It doesn't use JIT or anything like that, but it just goes to some uh, random memory location, the RWX memory uh, location. If you investigate with WinDebo, you can see the each RWX. Then it's running some code looks, <laughs> that looks very suspicious. So uh, we know that this is shared code, right? So the return instructions actually, the, actually this is more of, it's not RP, but this is some trampoline code that actually goes to the, uh, the what is that, the uh, shared code location. So this is that we now understand uh, this exploit is using some return address trampolining to jumping into some shared code. And we just pinpointed the actual vulnerable function, possibly, right? So probably this uh, address, the function that has this address. So yeah, there is a transcendent image address. I mean, this is what I said already, right? So, and next stage share code, you can even use this as a, some share code uh, analysis tool too, because it will log full image of share code. Uh, for this case, the share code is still there and our process dump had all these instructions there too. And jump I RAX and it, we can even pinpoint where the next stage share code is actually running, the decoded share code and everything. So dump instruction shows, maybe you can use uh, multiple dump instruction um, command to do further uh, investigations, how this shellcode is actually running. So conclusions, so this is not really about uh, groundbreaking research, but it's more about uh, uh, introducing the Intel PTs for the general so that they can use, uh, IPT knowledge is just a uh, casual tool that I wrote for my own purposes, right? But there is the concept, if you, you can uh, decode this process dump uh, within some reasonable time, and you can cache some information, some important information in a separate file, you can actually use it as a, a very strong tool for various purposes, just I shared, vulnerability analysis as an example, but you can, there is no limit actually. You can detect rootkits, you can detect, I don't know, some um, embedded uh, threats, or maybe you can detect some persistency mechanism on your machine. Yeah, you just take 10 seconds of uh, internet PT log for your full system and you can analyze there is any anomalies there. Maybe you can detect something interesting, right? Some code executions that are not supposed to happen, maybe uh, happening there. So this is a very promising uh, technology. And that is my conclusion. And that's it. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff, actually. Uh, uh, thanks again for, for speaking about it. Uh, while we were uh, waiting for some uh, questions uh, from the chat, uh, by the way, uh, can you imagine during all this time I thought your name was really uh, Matt O. <laughs> can you hear me? Are you on mute? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I already thought your name was Matt uh, during all those years. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt is my name, yeah. Yeah, for and, your uh, convenience. <laughs> And a, a, a quick question, actually. Uh, do you know a company called uh, Tetran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have very Does it do something similar or is it like something different? Uh, last time I checked, I think it's almost a year ago, they actually uh, dissected uh, what is it, the uh, uh, Windows kernel patch protection, right? So I think. It's been a while, but I think they used uh, emulation. But may, my memory might not correct, might be correct. Yeah, yeah. But I thought that it's really cool that they used some technology, but I don't think it, they used Intel PT. But you can use Intel PT for their purposes too, right? And uh, is that an equivalent like for ARM or is it just like specific to like... Uh... 
Yeah, I know ARM has similar mechanism, but uh, I didn't use it. Uh, I'm not really familiar with ARM. I'm more a Windows person, uh, even though Windows runs on ARM too. But yeah, ARM had it before Windows, I, uh, the, what is the Intel, I think, I remember, but you need more research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, I'm not very familiar with ARM and just started to get into it. I was like, I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah, uh, usually ARM has uh, some more advanced stuff before Intel CPU, right? Usually because they can move quickly with new features. Yes, I've been yeah. doing uh, a lot of cool stuff, but same thing, like most of it would be like Linux based, so like I've always stayed away from it. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of, there is a spender like uh, from GRSec in the chat. <laughs> he says thanks. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that's pretty cool. So the tool is on uh, on GitHub. So you're using Alex library, right? The Win uh, IPT underneath, which is yeah. using a Windows uh, driver underneath, right? So the thing is that so there are two phases. One is taking the the dump. You can use any tools you want, right? There were three yep. options that I gave you. One is the old uh, Cisco Talos tool. If you really want to do uh, some dumping from pre uh, RS6 machines, then that is a, that is one option. So after RS6, the the tool says RS5, but after RS6, uh, the tool is uh, really working well. The Win IPD, you can use Win IPD. It works really well. Just make sure you take multiple dumps and just compare uh, those dumps because sometimes it fails because it's not the tool itself, it's IPD does or maybe timing issues, right? The, the, the ultimate uh, option is using Intel uh, debugger extension. Okay. Uh, the only problem is you need a physical debugging interface and you need to buy, you need to invest 20 bucks for the debugging cable and mm. making USB debugging, kernel debugging, working on your systems are really challenging. It takes, so for someone, it takes days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And is, is it, it, works, like, is it yeah. using like a serial port or something or? Uh, excuse me, what was that? It, is it using a serial port for like the physical debugging or? Uh, USB 3.0. Ah, okay. That's... So yeah, it's uh, connecting to the remote machine. So I didn't dig deep, but Intel uh, extension is sending some package. Uh, I don't know if there is any open specification of, about that, but you can easily debug or reverse engineer this Intel PT. Uh, extension to figure out what kind of package it is sending to the remote machine to enable uh, this Intel PT loops. It will be interesting too. Yeah. Then you don't need to uh, potentially use uh, Win Debugger for that purpose, right? You can just uh, build your own Python library that is sending same uh, package sequences to the remote debugging machines to enable those features, I guess. But there is an extension for Windows DBG. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so okay. you just need a Win Debugger, Intel Instec uh, extension. You can just download it from Intel website. It's free. Mm -hmm. you just install it. But it's it has a little bit of a glitch. It it, it it has some glitches. You need to patch the binary to circumvent something. I can share later. Oh, uh, you need machines. to actually like patch uh, the actual extension. Yeah, but it's not really a <laughs> core function. But okay. it checks something. But somebody asked that question two years ago. Nobody answered. <laughs> and there is, a, if you Google that problem, there is only one entry from from the Google research, uh, research search research. And someone actually asked on the forum on the Intel. Nobody answered for two years. Oh. And I figured out it, it is some bug inside the Win, Win, uh, Intel driver. But it's not a critical bug. But it's just some some accessory check on the driver, then you just patch it out and everything works perfectly. But I can share that later too. I see, I see. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, and is it yeah. because like uh, Intel PT is not like widely used since uh, it had been released or? 
how come it was like left over uh, because from what i remember when it got released it was like something quite powerful for tracing people were like it's like really cool like richard johnson was i remember was really, yeah. really excited about it um, uh, i i have no idea actually i have no idea why maybe someone is already using it a lot right but intel pt so i'm looking into different technologies right i used uh, ttd at microsoft even before it was public i thought it was cool intel pt can be more powerful right but it doesn't save the context that is the limitation so it has a limitation right it doesn't save the cpu context it doesn't save register uh, values sometimes you can lose potentially lose instruction bytes if it is JIT or shell code so those things can limit uh the usage but still i think interpret is really powerful and using these two bases then you can make it more if you make it more easily accessible then i think you can find a lot of application of this uh technology i remember someone talked about uefi tracing using interpret mm. those things right those things are really cool so yeah especially for yeah that would be quite cool actually for uefi because it's probably not as complex mm -hmm. as uh, office and I mean, if you yeah, trace, yeah. like, mm -hmm. it, because, like, how, how big did you say, like, the cache file is now? Or, like, a few gigabytes? Uh, cache file for what? Uh, the, the Yeah, the block cache file uh, when you're, like, doing Yeah, the... for mine, I can share, I don't know, uh, I can share my screen. Right? Yeah, you're still sharing it, yeah. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. And hide the yeah. So this is full trace actually for IPT. There were some failures, right? So uh, PT file. Yeah, and this is the case, right? The PT file is just eleven megabytes. It doesn't make sense somehow. So no more PT file should be like this. One point four gigabytes. The other thing is that <laughs> you remember that I talked about all this compressing, all these things, right? Yeah. But most of them are just zero. Oh, wow. So most, <laughs> yeah. So they used a what lot the of. Hell? Uh, yeah. So they, they, because it's just a ring buffer, right? So, but it makes sense. But. But you could still compress it like before, right? I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So if you compress and still, it's just three megabytes. So look at this, right? So the PT file is not really big. So you yeah. just record full trace. It only takes three megabytes of your disk space for just Intel PT file. You need to take the process dump, right? Process dump file. Uh, I don't know where I saved it. Oh yeah, process and dump. And at which point are you taking the process dump? Like uh, after yeah, for, you want to analyze something yeah. or before to compare? You, you can do both, right? You can do both and you can compare that later. But for this case, you can just take the, you can actually uh, attach debugger to, to equation editor and just uh, hold it before it exits. Or you can use proc dump uh, to take dump whenever some processes exit. So there are a lot of different techniques, right? I took it when the process exits. So it's a 1.6 gigabyte but you just compress it, just 44 yeah. megabytes. So two information sources, you just generate a block cache file. Mm -hmm. Then block cache is 500 megabytes. It's just, I didn't do any optimization. This is just uh, Python, uh, the, what is the Python, the, what is that? Um, the structure, serialization uh, structure. Oh. I, I don't remember the name, you know, right? So it's just a loose uh, file. I didn't do any compression. Right? If you compress it, if you just split it, it's just 100 megabytes or something, right? Then using this information, you can do some analysis here. Yeah, well, I can share this. For example, this one. Find the API calls, then you just pass these things. Um, for example, I was just suspicious. Maybe it will be executing shallow execute, right? because it's showing some dialog boxes saying it failed to run something, or you can just 
search for this API calls, or maybe it's dropping some files. I want three cases. So find the API calls output for shell code execute. Yeah, you can get actual location. There's just one instance, right? So it's very exciting that you know that, oh, this sync offset has this information. Maybe you can trace back from this location yeah. where this uh, shell code execution is coming, right? Even for URL download, I don't know, it was, uh, it, it was not there. Create file. You wanna enumerate every instances where the file is created, files are created. And you can dump. So the only only problem is that you don't know what, what is the file name because file name is just short leave and just goes away. Yeah. So that is the limitation, but still it is very uh, powerful because it is full instruction dogs. Nothing. And so. it's tracking like uh, each instruction, not only like the the branch uh, jumps, right? Yeah, it's just expanding, right? So okay. the process uh, trace dump, original dump only records meaningful control flow changes. So that's why it's very, really small. Combining okay. with real images process dump in this case, you can reconstruct full instructions for oh. block, basic block changes, right? Okay. So that process, the converting process takes long, long time. So this approach is like more like, uh, oh, let's look at the basic blocks first, because if you want to decode full instructions, it, it will take forever. But the meaningful changes, they usually happen by basic blocks, basic blocks, right? Yeah. You only cache basic block locations, that is 500 megabytes. So based upon those basic block locations, now I want to know where the shell code execute happened. Then from the process uh, memory dump, we know the exact location, right? Because it's it's there, right? So yep. we just retrieve that memory address and searches for basic blocks, whether that memory location matches any cache, cache locations. And that cache location has information to the actual uh, PSB block inside Intel PT file, right? Now, Intel, from the Intel PT file, now we extract actual instructions. So mm -hmm. it's uh, more of a step-by-step -step approach from the this full Intel PT file to basic blocks, functions, then we go deep into the actual uh, instruction methods. In that way, you don't need to dump for full instructions, right? And you don't need to dealing with these huge uh, instruction files. You just uh, focus on the basic blocks. Okay. And uh, actually, I'm just checking uh, your, your blog post. No, there's a, a comment you didn't answer. I'm going to read it uh, for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, uh, like, yeah. Uh, there, there is an MSR register, debug CTL MSR, that can be used to track branch uh, jumps. Is there a difference between this and Intel PT? Is Intel PT better? Yeah, so uh, the truth is that I'm not really an expert in Intel CPU architecture, right? There are better guys out there. But from my memory, actually from the reverse engineering community, I remember it was, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, I think it was Pedro Amini, I, I remember. That he tried mm. to use those branch records uh to save something but oh so I it's pretty remember. old though that they may yeah really old, old i guess uh, but, oh, okay, but okay. The, there might there might be some technology in between the hmm. branch recording and something inside something between but now we have this intel pt and i don't know maybe 90 percent of machines that you have right now might have these features enabled already so you don't yeah. need any any new investment if you have one machine. So the approach that I'm doing, because you need to run some malicious uh, code on your system, right? So what, usually what I do is just use USB stick. You just install Windows image. So you can just search some information on the internet. You can find how you can install Windows on your USB SSD card or something like that. It's, I don't know, 30 bucks. You just buy them, just install Windows to go upon there are public tools available not from microsoft uh, from microsoft you need a special usb thumb drive right very expensive one 
I don't know, I remember maybe Wonderbox or something, but uh, there are some public tools that convert your Windows image to USB thumb drive image, right? Then you just boot from your USB thumb drive. Now, potentially maybe malware can damage your hard drive, but there are limited chances, right? So <laughs> you just take chances yeah. and you can just run, yeah, you can just run from uh, the USB thumb drive, you just run whatever, if you are researching malware, just malwares, I don't know, anything there, Take you take the information, you collect all those information, you can just re reuse your laptop after rebooting as your normal operating system. So you don't need any additional investment for this research because people think, that, oh, for this, because this, using, this is using hardware features, maybe I want to buy new laptops, maybe a thousand bucks, 500 bucks. You don't need new, new investment. Just using your normal machines. If you don't run really, really super uh, malicious stuff, <laughs> I don't think you will um, uh, install something to your hardware. So if it's reasonable, then you can just use it. Then if you are really serious, then you can just buy some machine, 500 bucks machines or thousand dollar machines yeah, to run uh, uh, these things as a just, uh, malicious box that you can run these things and collect things, analyze. There are a lot of possibilities. And I think uh, there might be some security product you can build up on this technology too. Yeah. I mean, even for sandboxing that you would get something like much better than uh, what you have yeah. now, I guess. Yeah, the, the only problem is that you can't take out those dynamic memory contents. They are just oh. gone. Yeah. I see, yeah. I see. Uh... Uh, cool. Actually, I have one question from the chat. Is it possible to get extra information about uh, these extracted addresses? For instance, some uh, VAD, PT protection rights, flags, and so on. Uh, can you repeat the question? I don't understand uh, the question very well. Uh, no worries. Is it possible to uh, get some extra information about those extracted addresses, for instance? No, it's, it's just okay, yeah. address. It's just, uh, okay. There, there, there are, you know that there are, whether it is from CR0 or CR3, so you know that whether it's a kernel instructions or just user instructions. You can yeah. know that. There are a lot of packages that indicate whether this is coming from the privilege uh, page or not. So you will know that it's kernel instructions or not. Oh, because you have the control register since you have the context also? I don't know. There are separate packages. Package is showing that oh from now on it's executing some user land instructions. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, okay, yeah, interesting. Are, yeah, bunch of different package out there. So, so you not get the actual Windows structure, but you get like the CPU information, which would contain like uh, more or less something like more or less similar. Yeah, I can. Uh, let me see. I can show you. Yeah, this is the PT dump output. Mm -hmm. PT dump is the tool from Levi PT. So if you run PT dump like this, just uh, PT dump is just from Levi PT, right? You just compile it and just run PT. Uh, I <laughs> removed the MTC. This is timing information. Mm -hmm. right? Pad is just padding. So th this is ironical because they wanted to save the uh, whatever this memory and trace log. They, they, they are go extreme as like a logging jump and non jump as just one bit. And they leave a lot of padding rights and they just uh, waste huge, huge uh, space. <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. So you, if you don't remove them, the PT dump file will be huge. So I, if I remove them, 1.4 gigabytes of dump is just mere 169 megabytes or something. So you can read it. PSB starts, this is, I think, uh, timing information, but it's not really important for us. Those are for some performance tuning purposes or whatever those other purposes than security research, I guess. TMA, I guess, timing, CVR, I don't know, PSB, and so this is a PSB packet. Timing, a lot of timing information, right? So mode exact, I don't remember what this is, but TPG, uh, I remember there was some um, uh, CR3, CR0 information here. But, yeah, I, I forgot a lot of things. TSX, exec. 
Mm. Yeah, I can't find it here, but yeah, it's okay. Uh, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a instruction that shows whether this is from kernel or uh, user land. Yeah. Then That's from cool. there, you yeah figure out. Yeah, that is extra information. And as new CPUs are coming out, probably they are adding new packet formats, possibly. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, there is uh, no more questions uh, from the chat. Uh, okay. Thanks again for joining us and for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, yeah. Don't forget to send me the the slides. <laughs> yeah. I see. Yeah. Uh, can you even ex export them? Like I see you're like uh, using like local host for your presentation. Oh no, it's in HTML. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, this one. Yeah, I can export it as a PDF. This uh, is your oh, video. Awesome. Yes. So I will share it later, maybe today. And thank you for inviting yeah, to me you. to this cool conference. I really like it. Yeah, no, no worries. Thanks again for 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 speaking and uh, joining us. Well, yeah, uh, I you. guess I have, have a good day. Yeah, you too. Bye. Thank you.